Hello, this is Dr. Germ Day Storms, and this is chapter one for Intro to Forensic Science. We're going to be going over an introduction to forensic science, what forensic science is, the parts to a forensic science laboratory, and important legal aspects of it. First off, forensic science is just the application of science to criminal and civil laws. Here, in particular, the focus of this class is going to be based off of those that are enforced by the criminal justice system uh, within the United States. Of course, most people now, because of our pop culture, have been inundated with forensic science. You see it all over in TV shows such as CSI, given here, or even on the true crime types of uh, shows such as 2020 and 48 Hours. This is both good and bad. It's a two-edged sword because it has helped heighten the, the education of science in society. However, many times it gives us what's called the CSI effect, an unrealistic expectation of what is to be expected uh, within for every crime scene. The first part of typical forensics lab, you can imagine the technical support being divided up into at least five different services. First up is physical science unit. The physical science unit really looks at the chemistry, physics, and geology to compare physical evidence. So some of these uh, topics could be, for example, ascertaining whether or not uh, certain drugs were present in the compound, or what kind of evidence for arson, like was an accelerant used, or perhaps you're looking at a soil sample for geology. Another technical support unit is the biology unit. This applies to all of the biological sciences. Okay, The ones that are typically thought of the most are those that have to do with the, bio, bi, the biological fluid. So for example, blood samples, you know, you may even talk about DNA analysis and hair, fiber, fiber samples, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> then we have the firearms unit. Firearms, of course, we're looking at ballistics here. We're gonna try to compare the weapon to the that fired to perhaps a bullet that was fired from that weapon we could also be looking at shotgun shells you can be looking at um the gsr patterns and um trying to determine the distance away that the shooter was from the victim itself then we have the document unit and the document unit looks for handwriting analysis and other question document issues such as wills and so on and so forth and typically there's a photographic unit, and the photographic unit is going to be recording, examining all the physical evidence at the crime scene. Okay. Now, there are other optional services, depending upon how large the lab is, and also what level. For example, is it a local forensics lab versus at the state level or even the federal level? We have a toxicology unit. Toxicology unit will look at the different body fluids. They're going to test for drugs, poisons. We can have the latent fingerprint unit. They're going to process and examine the evidence for latent fingerprints. And we'll explain later in the semester what a latent fingerprint really is. A police precinct may have a polygraph unit, which looks or conducts the lie detector tests. Likewise, you can have a voice print analysis unit, which attempts to tie a recorded voice to a particular suspect. This, this field is not as widely accepted as some of the other fields that we've mentioned so far. We can have an evidence collection unit, which has specially trained personnel that goes to collect and preserve physical evidence from a crime scene. And you can also have some very specialized forensic science services, such as forensic psychiatry, odontology, anthropology, computer science, engineering, things of that ilk. So forensic psychiatrist looks at the behavior um, between, looks at human behavior and their actions there that, that, ha that have happened. And so you've seen this as perhaps like for a behavior profiler. Also forensic odontologists, these are people who will try to identify the bodies based off of teeth, 
or sometimes I'll try to match up teeth, a bite marks to to a suspect's uh, dentition, meaning to the suspect's bite. Forensics engineers are concerned with the failure analysis, accident reconstruction, causes and origin of fires and explosions, um, perhaps like they may be investigating like what happens if a bridge fell down or part of a building gave way or a deck or something like that. Uh, computer science, of course, looks at digital evidence alone. So this next section of chapter one, we're going to be talking about the admissibility of evidence, especially with respect to forensic science and new techniques. You can imagine in the early 1900s, that's when forensic science really got started. You know, we started talking about fingerprinting was coming on on board, uh, hair analysis, you know, trying to compare different hair samples, fibers, and so on and so forth. And so the federal government had to step in and to try to determine, like, what would be considered admissible or inadmissible in court. One of the first cases happened in 1923, and it's not so important that you know the year. One of the important cases is called Fry v. United States, and this determined, set the initial guidelines for determining the admissibility for scientific evidence into the courtroom. And so they have something that they call the Fry Standard, okay? And the Fry Standard stated by the Supreme Court that the evidence in question must be generally accepted by the scientific community. Well, you can imagine what that means. What does it mean? You know, I mean, that's, that's, it's really iffy. So it's vague. It is generally accepted by the scientific community. And so then they laid some guidelines down in what's called the Federal Rules of Evidence Alternative. Many times they just simply call this Rule 702. Okay, so there are three caveats to it. One, first up, we have that the testimony is going to be based on fact or data, so you can't just make something up. Secondly, it has to be the product of reliable principles and methods within that general field of science. Okay, so for example, since I'm not a geologist, you wouldn't be calling me as an expert testimony to talk about the seismic shift of the plate of plate tectonics. Finally, the witness has applied principles reliably to the facts of the case. This one may be a little more confusing in the sense that you can't just get up and testify about anything, even if it's a scientific principle. So, for example, you would not want someone to be talking about DNA and recovering DNA from a case that's involving a disputed will, okay? Because then that doesn't make sense. You could maybe they they did the correct the witness did the correct principles in looking at DNA technology, but DNA technology has absolutely nothing to do with the facts of that case in particular. This was fine for quite some time. However, in 1993, it was dictated that the Fry standard was not absolute. That was the case of Daubert v. Merrill, Merrill Dow Pharmaceutical, Inc., and the U.S. Supreme Court asserted that the Fry standard doesn't have to be an absolute prerequisite for the admissibility of scientific evidence. Then, they say that the trial judges are said to ultimately be responsible as gatekeepers for the admissibility and validity of the scientific evidence presented in court, as well as the expert testimony. This is the important term here gatekeepers. So ultimately, it's the trial judge that gets to decide whether or not that that evidence will be admissible in, in court. So, in the Daubert decision, the Supreme 
court came up with guidelines. And these guidelines are very important. So first, you need to know whether the scientific technique or theory can be or has been tested. Secondly, whether that technique or theory has been subject to peer review and publication in science. It's very important that you have other people besides just yourself that can repeat and review your, 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 your findings. Obviously, and this should make sense, what's the rate of error? How reliable is it truly? Another important point to, to make note of is that you have to have some type of standard. Okay, there must be, whoops, there must be some type of standard used in controlling the technique's operation. And then finally, we have whether or not that theory or method has attracted acceptance within the relevant, that's the important thing, the relevant scientific community. So once again, you wouldn't want my opinions on climate change, for example, in a court case because that, that's not the scientific community from which I come. Okay. Forensic scientists may also provide expert court testimony. An expert witness just means that it's someone that the court, you know, once again, the trial judge being the gatekeeper, has determined possesses knowledge relevant to the trial that is not expected of the average person. <clears throat> and this person is usually called on to evaluate the evidence based on their specialized training. And many times you'll see an expert witness for both the prosecution and a different one for the defense. Okay, and so this expert is going to then express his or her opinion as to what the data really means or really indicate. And the necessity for the forensic scientist to appear in court has been imposed on the criminal justice system by the case of Melendez Diaz v. Massachusetts. So some of the other, one or one interesting example, another one to think about, is the court case of Copolino v. State. What happened in Copolino v. State, in your textbook, gives more detail about it, but it's really interesting is a man was expected or was suspected of killing, murdering his wife and he was having an affair. And he was a doctor and he was suspected of using a chemical compound that is lethal but that your body breaks down so it's not uh, noticed or was noticeable previously before that in an autopsy. And so what they did is here in Florida is they had scientists come up with a new technique specifically to show that this poison could be broken down and would make this other metabolite inside your body. And they utilize that to convict uh, the defendant. And the defendant then appealed that based off of the fact that they said that that technique had not been peer reviewed yet. And that so therefore he should not have been able to be convicted on that since it hadn't gone through the entire peer review process. And um, that the, the court case should be thrown out. Well, in Copeland v. State, the Supreme Court said that science essentially was, was rapidly advancing so quickly that the peer review process wasn't able to keep up with it. And so under these extreme circumstances, you can actually submit and have evidence that is admissible as long as, even though it's not been published necessarily, as long as it's accepted by other people within that same field and that the standards were used appropriately. So hopefully this has helped explain some of the general introduction to forensic science and also important court cases.